Hi folks, I've not made a video in a while and that's simply because I've been working on this one probably for eight months now. Um, as you probably have seen in my previous videos, I'm quite adept at using AutoCAD um, and that's all very well and good. You can model things really, really accurately, but you're only really modeling an instance in time and I want to be able to model sort of and well, animate the model but maintain the accuracy of AutoCAD so I decided to teach myself how to use 3D Studio Max which is made by the same company as AutoCAD and um, conveniently the um, the models import and export from each other seamlessly maintaining all scales accuracy coordinate systems the lot so it seemed like a logical program to learn and I would by no means call myself an expert, in fact I would call to any experts out there in 3D Studio Max for some assistance to um, really get this um, animation down. I mean I've, everything is, is great geometrically, it's just I would like to add things to it like um, umbras and penumbras and that's the bit I'm struggling with. Um, but as far as, as, far as um, animating the the motions of the orbital bodies um, it's really really good and totally accurate as well so the procedure was drawing everything in AutoCAD um, to to perfect scale um, importing it into 3D Studio Max and animating it and for the rest of the video I'm going to be concentrating on the the August Eclipse in 2017 today's the 14th of August and um, so it's a week from today it's going to occur and I'm going to be quite interested quite interested to see the the motion of the the, um, the moon as it passes over the Sun what sort of tra trajectory it takes because there's some anomalous things I found um, in my model and all I've done is used NASA's data um, and it's been a basically a copy paste exercise I've copied and pasted all their data into AutoCAD um, to draw all the orbital bodies in the in the positions that they, they say they're in and, and then animated them in 3D Studio Max. So just to give you a quick, a quick demonstration, I've got it set at this time frame because that's just before the solar eclipse. So let's just play the animation and let's just concentrate on this one. I'll maximise the viewport. Let's just play it. And there we go. Now this may look may not look to scale, but it's simply because of the viewing angle we're looking at it from. Um, I'll do a bird's eye view in a minute of the same same position, which is this one here. It's all the same model. Um, and if I highlight the moon in the model, you can see it's just here. It's too small to see without me highlighting it and selecting it. So let's play play the animation again. It's all four, all four of these are the same model, so you can see it's perfectly scaled. Um, so let's just take a look now at this one. Now this one's not to do with the eclipse really, this is just a demonstration of what we can do with moon phases. So let me just turn the earth off because it gets in the way every time. And I'm going to quickly slide this time slider back and forward. You can see the notation occurring there. We've seen them animations before. So we can do moon phases. And finally this one in the top left. Let me go back to the eclipse again. Which I happen to know the time frame for. Um, and let's go some time prior. So the, the purple line you can see is the um, moon's orbit and let's just play the animation so we'll maximize it there we go so like I say this one is for an entire year but I cannot maintain perfect accuracy for an entire year I am working on <coughs> 
coming up with a way to do it, but I can do it on short um, periods of time, like for instance the eclipse. I can um, model it really, really accurately, accurately using NASA's data, and that's going to be what this video is about. Um, so that was just a quick demonstration for what can be done and what I'm working towards. The, the ultimate goal is to have uh, a, a model for every year. And the secret is being able to get to be able to model it quickly using the NASA data, which is one of the things I'm working on. But like I say, for short periods of time, like the solar eclipse, um, that's pretty easy to model. So now we're going to get into that. Um, and I'm going to show you exactly how I do it in probably more detail than what most people would like, but I feel it's important to get across the exact method that I've used. So, you know, one people get an idea of sort of my my logic and my procedure, and two, for anybody to spot any mistakes that I may have made, because there's every possibility I've made a mistake, and if so. Um, I would like somebody to point it out to me and I can perhaps remodel it. So let's get into it. So before we start I just want to preface a few things. Um, I'm using this um, tool here, this ephemeris tool on the NASA website to derive all my distances, angles, um, anything. So this tool here can be used and you can put in um, the type of observation you want to do, you can put in the target body, which is the moon in this case, and the observer location, so you can put um, geocentric, which is measuring from centre to centre of um, orbital bodies, or you can put in a location on the Earth with um, longitudes and latitudes, which is what this is set in here now at. You can put the time you want it to be from and, then, and to, and you can tell it how many um, increments or the size of the increments that you want it to do it in and in this case it's in every minute um, and then if you go to table settings in here um, you can set what, what exactly it is that you want it to tell you I don't want number six so I want the apparent azimuth and elevation observer range and range rate and orbit plane angle they're the three um, sort of parameters that I want to find for each minute in a given time period. So if I use them settings and I generate the ephemeris, what it's done now is it has given me um, the date and the time in one minute increments and this one's not applicable, and um, the azimuth and elevation, um, and it gives us the distance here from the um, observer location to the target body, which is from the Earth to the Moon in this case, and it's in kilometres. Everything's in kilometres, and it's to the um, exponent five, so it's um, the decimal place should be moved five places to the right. Okay, so all angles are going to be in degrees, all measurements in kilometres, all times are in universal time, UTC. And um, that's what NASA uses here, so I'm going to be using that. There's going to be no, um, no taking into account daylight savings unless we're taking it from a website that's used daylight savings, which you'll see, it, see later. And we've got to convert it back to universal time, which is the same as Greenwich Mean Time. So it's measured from the prime meridian. So that's where I'm going to be deriving all of my information, with the exception of the times and the dates on which the aphelion and the perihelion occur, which I'll be using time and date for. OK, so the next thing I just wanted to mention was this company here called Autodesk. And they are the, the um, software developers for AutoCAD and 3D Studio Max and in fact many many pieces of software that you can see listed down here. But 3D Studio Max and AutoCAD are going to be the two main programs I'm using. Um, so this is their forum section on their website 
and they've got really really good forums lots and lots of really knowledgeable people um, I've bounced ideas off them quite a lot of times some of them have written me scripts to automate what I'm trying to do um, it's just made the whole thing much easier so AutoCAD and 3D Studio Max they're the two main pieces of software so the last thing I wanted to mention was um, the scale that I'm going to be doing this to and to use the actual figures um, with the decimal points in the places um, where they should be i.e. this one five to the right um, AutoCAD and 3D Studio Max um, do not like to handle them sort of numbers so for the whole of this model I'm going to be moving the decimal place three times uh, three places backwards so I'm going to be dividing by a thousand um, so that's the distances and the radius of the, the bodies, the moon, the sun and the earth. So everything is going to be sc scaled down by a thousand times. Okay, so let's jump into it. Uh, we know that Kepler's first law states that all planets in the solar system orbit the sun in an elliptical fashion. So this here being Earth's orbit, albeit very exaggerated in the flatness here, it's said to be an almost perfect circle, um, only slightly elliptical. So we see in January, usually around January the 4th, um, the, the point at which the Earth is closest to the Sun is called the perihelion, and that is on average 147.1 million kilometres. Then in July, um, July sort of, sort of the 3rd or 4th, maybe sometimes the 5th, um, this is said to be the aphelion and this is the point at which the earth is farthest from the sun and this is approximately 152.1 million kilometers you'll notice the sun isn't at the center the center would be around here somewhere <clears throat> and you'll notice that um, the the earth on the aphelion and on the perihelion are both along this line here which is referred to as the um, major axis of the ellipse the semi-major axis is from the center to the end point and from the center to the end point and the semi-minor axis is from the center to this point or the center to this point and the whole the whole distance being the minor axis so um, this is this distance is given this distance is given so we know to find the center point here all we have to do is Add these two figures and div divide them by two and that'll give us the center point of this ellipse um, the reason we need that is so that we can determine this distance here and we do that by using the semi minor sorry the semi major axis distance and the eccentricity value of the ellipse which is given to us by um, NASA so this is their earth fact sheet and down here we've got the orbital eccentricity value of 0 0.01671022 so if we go to Wikipedia's um, page on semi-major and semi-minor axes it gives us a formula down here b equals a times the square root of 1 minus the eccentricity value squared so b being the blue one here that's the one we want to find so b equals the distance of A, which is the semi-major axis here, uh, multiplied by the square root of 1 minus the eccentricity value squared. So we now have all the values we need to be able to determine the, um, the value B here. And then we can go ahead and draw this ellipse in AutoCAD. The only other thing to mention is... Um, the perihelion point here, which is the place we're going to be starting from, um, in 2017, it will obviously start at one position. Then the 2017 aphelion will be 180 degrees um, around here from the sun. And <clears throat> as it traverses and goes back to January again in 2018, it's going to be in a slightly different position. So that means that the semi-major axis distance is going to be very slightly different so in order to draw this half of the orbital path we need to use 
the eccentricity value and the semi minor sorry semi major axis value for 2017 the 2017 perihelion and to do this half of the orbital path we need to use this aphelion and the 2018 um, perihelion distance so this um, shape of this first half of the orbit um, necessitatively has to be slightly different to this one since this one ends in a different place in January 2018. So next we're going to find the days and the dates um, on which the perihelions and the aphelions occur and I'm going to use timeanddate.com um, to find the dates um, because it gives it to us conveniently um, but the distances here they do not match the NASA distances. They're close, but they're not exact. So I'm going to disregard the distances given on timeanddate.com. Um, I'm just going to concentrate on the, the times and the dates that they give us so that we can use them and find it off the NASA website. Um, one thing to note is the Aphelion here on July the 3rd, these um, times are all local London time. So this accounts for British summer time. Um, so I'm going to subtract a, a, an hour off this time here. Um, so this will actually be 8.11 p.m. or 20.11 p.m. So let's go ahead now and look at the NASA JPL Horizons website um, at these days. So the first one we're going to look at is January the 4th, 2017 at 17 minutes past 2. So we've got January the 4th, 2017 till, till um, January the 5th. 2017 in one minute increments. So I've already um, generated the data. So if we scroll down, I've highlighted it as well. So we just need to find it. There it is. So 17 minutes past two, January the 4th, 2017. And there we have the distance from the Earth to the Sun, center to center. You see it's got the exponent, um, exponential um, to the eight. <clears throat> Let's go and look at the next one, which is um, July the 3rd, 2017, at, and remember we said it was 8.11 p.m. There we go. Um, so there is the distance from the Earth to the Sun on that date. Just, I'm not going to go through it all on every single example but if you want to pause it and look you can but you can actually verify that these are the aphelion and the perihelion distances because the um, the distances on this one for instance they go 988777 98777 so this is actually the longest this is actually the, the, the largest distance um, same goes with the one we just looked at um, this is the smallest distance you can see it's going 98, 97, 96, 96, 96, 97, 98, 99. So you can see this is the actual shortest distance. So let's just verify the last one in 2018, which completes the orbit, um, which is the 3rd of January at 5.34 a.m. Um, so 3rd of January 2018 till the 4th of January 2018 in one minute, one minute increments. Uh, it was 5.34 a.m is just there and there is the distance so I've plugged these all the, all these numbers into an Excel spreadsheet seen here and I've copied and pasted them into here so if we concentrate on the, the color coded ones at, at the top here if you forget the moon ones for now concentrate on the earth so the perihelion um, in 2017 which is blue that was the figure that we've just found from the NASA JPL Horizons website um, there was the aphelion distance and there is the 2018 um, perihelion distance this here um, has been derived using a formula in the spreadsheet and you can see here it's d5 plus d6 divided by 2 so d5 would be this one D6 is this one, so that's the perihelion and the aphelion that we spoke about earlier. So we're adding them together and dividing them by 2 to find the semi-major axis. 
and then we're multipl multiplying it by the square root of 1 minus here is the eccentricity value that we got from the NASA website the NASA earth fact website and then we're squaring the value and that gives us this value here which looks about right so you can see that um, the perihelion is obviously the shortest the aphelion is the furthest and the semi minor axis distance is in between the two so 147 um, 149 152 we've done the same for the second part of the orbit so we've for this one we've used d6 and d7 which is this one and this one so now we're accounting for the 2018 um, perihelion distance um, as I explained earlier and it's the same eccentricity value and as you can see the figure 149 is between the 147 and the 152 so we know we're in the right ballpark well in actual fact it should be absolutely perfect we've used the um, the exact figures given to us by NASA so as I mentioned earlier I'm drawing all of this to a scale a thousand times smaller than actual scale so over here these figures here are just these figures except we've moved the decimal point three places back or divided by a thousand so these are the figures I'm going to be using ultimately in AutoCAD to draw the semi-major axis distance and um, these are the distances here which are again um, these semi-minor axis distances um, scaled by a thousand times or scaled down by a thousand times okay let's get on to drawing the ellipse or the orbital path in AutoCAD okay so I've drawn the Sun in here and um, we're going to take the perihelion of 2017 line from the center and um, we're going to go and <clears throat> find the value in the spreadsheet um, I'm going to copy that value I'm going to paste it into AutoCAD and there we have the perihelion distance drawn to scale if I click on it and go to the properties down here and look at the length you can see the value here is the value we've just copied so next I'm going to draw the aphelion for 2017 again from the center and then we'll go and find the the aphelion distance I'm going to copy that and we're going to paste it into AutoCAD and there now we have the aphelion drawn to scale okay next we're going to draw the uh, Earth's orbit or at least the first half so we're going to start the ellipse command and first of all it's asking us for the center of the ellipse now we know that it's not where the Sun is since these are different lengths so there's a command in AutoCAD where we just type M2P and it's the distance between two points sorry the midpoint between two points so if I pick the end point here and the end point here it will automatically find the midpoint between them two points and as you can see it is not the center of the Sun so now it's asking us for the end point of the ellipse so since we're at the center we can go to either end of this but I'm going to choose this end and it's now asking us to show, to draw the sort of the flatness uh, this would be the eccentricity value um, and we can take that again from the eccentricity value calculated um, in the spreadsheet so it was this one first for the um, first half of the year so I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste that value into AutoCAD there we go so as you can see it is for all intents and purposes a perfect circle although we know it's not 
So let's just throw a distance um, from, let's pick the quadrant point here. Um, it's not going to let us do it, so let's type it quad. There it is. And we're going to take that distance to a perpendicular position, which should be the center of the ellipse, just there. And if we look down here, the distance, where's it gone? Let's bring it up. The distance is here, the delta y value, which should match this one here, which it does. Yep, it does. Okay, so we know that this is only valid for the first half. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the trim command and I'm going to create that as a cutting edge and that as a cutting edge and I'm going to delete that bit. Okay, next we have to draw the 2018 perihelion which is in the same position as this so I'm going to freeze this layer out just to avoid confusion. Um, so I'm going to turn that one off temporarily and we're going to change to the 2018 perihelion which is the green one. So if I'm going to draw a line now again from the centre of the sun and we'll take the value here which is the scale distance of the 2018 perihelion. I'm going to copy that I'm going to paste it down here and now if we go and have a look and zoom right in at first glance it looks like it's at the same position but if we zoom right in you can see it's not it falls short so is that correct is the 2018 perihelion shorter than the, than the 2017 and yes it is quite significantly. So we know it's drawn it in the correct position. So now um, I'm going to temporarily set the layer to zero and I'm going to switch off or freeze this orbit to avoid any confusion and I'm going to draw the second half of the orbit from here to here. So again I'm going to start the ellipse command um, it's asking for the center, so I'm going to type M2P. And we know the center is now going to be between this one and this one. Again, it's not where the sun is. So it's asking us for um, the end point of the axis. So this time I'm going to choose this side. It doesn't really matter, but I'm going to choose this one. And now it's asking us for the distance to the other axis. Um, so that would be this value here. And we're going to paste that in. There we go. Again, it looks like a perfect circle. Um, and I'm going to trim away using these as cutting edges this side. Okay, I'm going to switch the other layer back on, the orbital, um, the orbit layer. Um, which is there. I'm going to turn this into an orbit layer. And you'll notice that these are, in at the minute, two separate entities. There's that one and that one. When I import this into 3D Studio Max, I want it to be one entity so that as I'm making the Earth move around here, it, it continues and doesn't stop at this point. So I need to join these two to make it one complete entity. So if I just double click on this one, I can go join, select objects, it's asking me that one and that one. And now if I select it, it's one complete object. And of course, of course these two points, if I zoom right in, 
do not meet. So we now have an absolutely mathematically perfect elliptical orbit. So I've now imported the ellipse into 3D Studio Max, which we're looking at now, a top down view. And if I move this time slider along, you can see the Earth there moving, the red icon representing the Earth. And as it moves all the way to the end, it comes and falls right back at the end. So this is currently 523,637 frames long. Now the reason I've um, used that figure is because I've used my spreadsheet to calculate the number of minutes between the 2017 and the 2018 perihelion. So start to finish at this position. Um, this means that I can stop this at any point and each point, each frame is one minute. So I can use Excel to find a minute that I want to look, look at and get it to stop at that particular minute or I can just type that particular minute in here. So that's the number of minutes from the 2017 perihelion. So the reason that this, the original one that I showed you at the beginning was not quite accurate is because as you can see, this is moving around this ellipse at a linear speed. And we're told that that doesn't happen. It's actually um, slower at the aphelion here, and then it comes round and it speeds up as it gets to the perihelion. And so, when I did my model the first time, um, the eclipse wasn't actually occurring. I had to manipulate it to show you what I did at the beginning. Um, so I obviously wanted to find a much more accurate way of doing this, and I have actually come up with a way. But we're restricted on the time span. Currently, we're restricted on the time span that I can do. I can do probably a couple of weeks, um, but not the entire year, which is my ultimate aspiration. Um, I am working on um, a solution to it with Autodesk, um, but when I try to import the number of points that I need um, from AutoCAD into 3D Studio Max, um, it just won't handle the amount of points. Basically, it won't even handle a whole month. So getting a whole year in here is going to be pretty tough. I'm not sure if it's actually possible, but for the purposes we need, um, looking at eclipses and such like, um, I think it's it's pretty good. Okay, so now I'm going to draw the globe and I'm going to show you how I derive latitudes and longitudes of locations on the globe. So let's start by drawing a sphere. I've drawn an axis already here in the Z direction. So let's draw a sphere starting from the midpoint of this line at 6.371. That's 6,371 kilometers. And um, we're going to say that the prime meridian is on this x axis here. So let's look at it from this direction. So the prime meridian is coming out this way on the x axis. So let's change the color. I have a, um, a cyan and I'm going to draw a line again from the midpoint of that line in this direction at 6.371 so that would be the where it intersects with the equator and the prime meridian so let's switch to a front view there's the cyan line we drew just there and I'm going to rotate that um, by an angle of 51.5 degrees north so 51.5 and that would be the location of London um, now I can do a similar thing for Hopkinsville Kentucky which is the location of the eclipse at its maximum um, so let's switch to a top view now uh, so I'm going to put it back to its default view. Okay, so you can see London here. Um, I'm going to draw another line. Let's do it a different colour. Let's go for um, magenta. And I'm going to draw it again. Let's go from the centre of the sphere. And we're going to do it in this direction again. 6.371 is the radius. And 
I've already found the longitudinal latitude of Hopkinsville, Kentucky, so it's 87.48 86 degrees west. So I've copied that value. I'm going to rotate the line about the center of the sphere and AutoCAD counts um, anti-clockwise. If you're moving around this way, it counts that positively, but we want to move around this way, so it's a negative value. So at the command line down here, I just put the minus sign and then paste in the 87 degrees. And there, there it's put um, the longitude for Hopkinsville. So now I just need to put in the latitude. But to do this, I need to align our sort of screen view with that line. So I'm going to type in UCS, which stands for User Coordinate System. Um, I'm going to set the origin to the center of the sphere and the x-axis endpoint to the endpoint here. And you can see what it's done is it's aligned the, the x-axis now with this line. So if I switch to a top view, rotate it, you can see the the red and the green line here, that's just like an AutoCAD background um, line. It's aligned the, the magenta line here with it. So if we switch to a front view now, it's in the right plane for us to be able to rotate it um, to the desired latitude. So now if I rotate that line, Again, about the center of the sphere and because it's um, anti-clockwise it needs to go this time it's a positive value and the value is 36.8656 degrees north so let's just paste that value in there we go so we have two um, coordinates now one for London one for Hopkinsville Kentucky. What I'm going to do is off off camera I'm going to put some compasses on these positions. I'm going to add an equator and I'm going to add a zenith position and the zenith position will be at um, 1500 hours on the day of the eclipse just prior to it starting. So It'll become apparent why I'm doing that later on in the video, but I'm just I'm going to use exactly the same method here. And if I go to timeanddate.com, so I've already done it here. I've put it as Monday, the August the 21st, 2017, at 1500 hours. You can see the eclipse is about to start. <clears throat> and down here it says. The position of the sun on Monday, the August the 21st, um, at 1500 hours UTC. The zenith is latitude this and longitude that. So I've copied and pasted them into a, a converter to get me it in decimal degrees. And so here we've got um, 11 degrees 54 minutes, 44 degrees 14 minutes. And it's north and west. So I've converted it back now, and these are the um, longitudes and latitudes in degrees. So I'm just going to use exactly the same method I've just used to find the zenith at that particular time, at this time here, 1500 UTC. So I'll do that now. Okay, so I've gone ahead and drawn everything I said I was going to draw. And the orange um, one here is the zenith at 1500 hours. And if I just orbit around. You can see I've drawn the yellow equator around there. I've drawn the London and the Hopkinsville um, compasses. So now we're going to go on to, uh, to um, importing this into 3D Studio Max and adding the globe image onto the sphere. And so here it is. We need to tilt it back now to 23.44 degrees. So I happen to know that from this view it's minus 23.44 degrees. There we go. Now we have to align the axis to the sun 
at one of the solstices and I'm going to choose the June, the summer solstice um, and to do this is um, it involves finding the exact location of the Earth on the elliptical orbit um, at that exact instance which is the tricky bit um, so let's get into that okay so I'm sure you've all seen diagrams like this before but I just wanted to show that in um, June on the summer solstice that the um, axis is pointing towards the Sun in the northern hemisphere and it is pointing exactly towards the Sun so let's find out uh, exactly when the summer solstice is so it's 2017 it's the June solstice so it's the 21st of June and it's 524 British summer time so let's subtract an hour off that to get back to universal time we've got 424 a.m. so let's go to NASA's website and I've put all the values in already and we've got the target body has been the Sun geocentric so we're measuring center to center um, time span is the 21st of June to the 22nd of June in one minute increments and I've already generated it so I've highlighted it as well so let's scroll down there it is so it's 4.24 a.m. 21st of June so that there is the distance from the Earth to the Sun on the summer solstice so I'm going to go back to AutoCAD and um, the way in which I can find exactly whereabouts on this elliptical orbit that the Earth um, actually is at that particular time is by drawing a circle with a radius equal to the distance we've just found. So let's just briefly look at what it's actually doing. So if I draw a circle from the centre of the Sun and if I were to draw it at a, ra at a radius equal to this blue line here it would obviously intersect with the ellipse at this point here and conversely if I was to do the same at the aphelion here it would intersect at this point here and any distance or any radius in between them two values is going to intersect this ellipse somewhere around here so you can see anywhere around here and you can see the circle is gradually getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it gets to its smallest point just here so if, if NASA are giving us the distance to the Sun at a particular time we can use simple geometry as I've just demonstrated to find exactly when that is so let's paste that radius value in here you can see I've already done it once um, and let's put the decimal point in the right place so it's 152 million kilometers and we're divided by a thousand so the decimal point goes in just there and there we have it we've got the um, circle drawn in for the June solstice now we know this is July so it's going to fall somewhere just before that so let's um, take the line command now and it should find the intersection point and that's the when this little green icon here goes to a little cross that's an intersection point point. where is it I didn't think it was as far back as that there it is okay so I'm going to draw the line back to the center of the Sun So let's just check with the distance of the line. It's length 152031.01859. And we know it intersects at this location here. So all I need to do now is throw an angle on here. So let's pick that and I'm going to pick this and this. And we have an angle of 12.5 degrees. So let's select it and we can go down here. Measurement there. I'm just going to copy it. And I will now go into 
3D Studio Max and just rotate the earth by that amount and for some reason it thinks that the z-axis is at 90 degrees at the minute so what I need to do is subtract um, the value that we've just found of 12 degrees from 90 to get this correct so I'm just going to go to my calculator I'll put 90 minus 12.53 degrees so that's 77.465 degrees so I'm going to copy that and you can see I'm maintaining all the accuracy here I'm always copying the, all the values after the decimal point and I'm going to paste that into there and there we go it's and then if you saw there it tilted the axis of the earth um, up by 12 and a half degrees so we know that if we was to move this round all the way around to June now, bearing in mind it is in January at the, per at the perihelion position, if I was to move this all the way around to the June position that we just found, it would the axis would be pointing directly at the sun. Okay, so having um, found how to determine the position of the Earth at any given time, it got me to thinking whether you could actually automate this in AutoCAD and get it, it to find all of them for me and I know there was a, a programming language associated with AutoCAD called Lisp so I just went on their, um, their forum posed the question and some bright spark um, wrote me a little script here I won't pretend to understand all the language but basically what it does is it um, it creates a circle taken from with the radius taken from a spreadsheet it, it then finds the intersection point between that circle and the ellipse. It draws a point to that intersection and then it deletes the circle. Then it moves on to the next one, draws another circle of a different radius and so on and so on and so on. So it, it automates the whole process for me and finds exactly where the Earth's going to be where, for any given time period. So we're looking at the um, eclipse. So let's go to timeanddate.com and this is the page on the, the forthcoming eclipse. <clears throat> Scroll right down, it tells us when it begins and when it ends in UTC time. So 1546 till 2104. So for round numbers, I'm going to take, take my model from 3 o'clock till 10 o'clock. <clears throat> so let's go to NASA's website. I'll put all the data in, 21st to the 22nd. But this time I've changed it to download a text file with all the data rather than displaying it all below. So I'm going to generate the ephemeris and it'll put one down here. There it is. Open it. So we said we're going to go from 3 till 10. So let's go down to 3 o'clock. There it is. So delete all that. <clears throat> And I'm going to go from or until 10 o'clock. So there's 10 o'clock. I'm going to delete all that below. Okay, so we'll save that. <clears throat> now, if we go to the spreadsheet, um, I've created a, a uh, a column here uh, where we can just copy and paste them um, values in which are the, just the distances all, the, all these given times so you can see the first one's at 3 o'clock there so I've prepared it already um, we've now got to insert sheet from file and what this is going to do is import that text file that we've just created uh, where is it? Horizons, that one so there's all the information it's going to import Okay, and it's going to create a new sheet down here for us. There it is, Horizon Results. So, this is the column here we want. These are all the distances. So, I'm just going to uh, copy. I'm going to put it into this one. Paste. Yeah. So, leave them top two. So, this is the column we pasted. This column here. Is just that column divided by a thousand. 
So this create intersections is the actual command that it's going to call within AutoCAD. So this will call that list that list routine. Um, it'll go through its um, its data. It'll wait for a um, a circle radius, which is this one. Then it'll carry on and find the intersections, delete the circles, etc. Then it'll just move on to this next one. So what I have to do is um, copy all of this. So just copy that. And in AutoCAD, I just paste that at the command line down here. And we know it's going to be around here somewhere, August. So let's just paste. You can see what it's doing down here. Look, it's just cycling through, and all these radius, all these radiuses here. Look, it'll take a, a few seconds to complete. But you can see this is just, this is just for, you know, what was it, three till ten, seven hours, and it's taking this long. So. You can see the problems you'd face doing it for a year. Okay, it's done. So you can see the cross it's put in here. I'm just going to change the point mode to dots rather than crosses. Okay, let's just delete the orbits. And there they are. Zoom right in. Let's put all these dots in. And if I select them, We've got 421 points, which uh, it says 422 here, but the, the top line is blank, I think. Yeah. Okay. So, go back to AutoCAD. Each one of these, it's not an entity as such in AutoCAD. It's just a point. It's just a. It, all it has associated with it is an X, a Y, and a Z position, as you can see here. And. What I'm able to do is use AutoCAD's data extraction tool. I'll go data extraction. I've already done it, so I'm going to edit an existing data extraction. Which was that one? All. So it's all it's found is points. So yeah, that's correct. And we want the X, Y, and Z position of all the points. And there they are. So now I can um, export this to a text file. Okay, next. So output data to external file. I'm going to um, export it to a text file for now. Earth position test text. Save. Yeah. Finish. So earth position test dot text. There it is. So I now have a text file with X, Y, and Z coordinates for every single position from 3 o'clock until 10 o'clock at night for the um, solar eclipse. Well, 10 o'clock UTC, should I say. So you may be wondering what I'm going to do with all this data now. Um, so in 3D Studio Max, there's also a, a programming language. Um, called Max Script. So, again, I went on the Autodesk forum and asked if it was possible to insert point coordinates um, directly from a spreadsheet or a text file into 3D Studio Max, and then to draw a line to, to sort of draw them a line in between each point and to animate a, an object along that line. And it turns out you can. Um, so, another kind soul wrote me another script this time um, in Max script and one of the examples is here so this it starts off with point array then you put all the XY coordinate details in so this is here the syntax that it needs is um, open bracket then you've got your X coordinates then a comma then your Y coordinate then a comma then your Z coordinate which is always zero in this case closed square bracket then a comma um, so I've got all this data that I need, the X, the Y, and the Z, but I just haven't got it in this format with all the commas and um, the brackets. So 
let's go back to Excel or the spreadsheet and then insert sheet from file and it was earth position test.text there we go you can see you've got position x y and z it seems to have shifted the columns across the headings of the columns but that doesn't really matter for what we need so i'm going to import that and it should create a new sheet again there you go earth position test so we obviously don't need that top row so here we've got the x the y and the z positions as extracted from autocad so another tab or another sheet that i created is here so I can, column b i can enter the x coordinate column d the y and column f the z and you can see i've put the square bracket the comma the comma square bracket comma um, and then this h column what that does is it concatenates all of the um, the data from each one so let's show you Let's go back to the earth position test. We want to copy the X into here. Um, we want the Y copy into here. And then we want the Z, which are actually all zeros, copy into here, paste. Okay, there's one missing from there. So is that. So is that. So that's comma, comma, open bracket. Okay. So you can see here now, it's we now have the format that we need to insert into the Max script. So again, I'm going to copy that column. We're going to open up our max scripts now, which is this one. And I'm going to put my cursor just there. And then I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom. And put my cursor there. And we're going to paste. And we don't need that last comma. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to save that. Now all I need to do, I've got a blank model here in 3D Studio Max. All I need to do is drag and drop this one that we just modified into here. And hopefully it's created a shape and a dummy object. So let's zoom to the shape. And there we have it. We've got the shape drawn in here. And you can see the dummy object just there. We're at 340 frames at the minute. So if I just scroll back and forth, let's go back to let's get to number one. So you can see number one is the starting position here, and 421 is the ending position here. And if I zoom into this line and select it, and We'll look at the vertex positions. Uh, I've zoomed in too far. There we go. There's the vertex positions. So we're at the end position here. If you just watch this object as it as I step back, it just steps through all them vertex positions, and each one of them represents one minute. So what we're going to do now is attach the globe to this dummy object, get it spinning, and then we can move on to the moon. <clears throat> I've now imported everything we need into 3D Studio Max, and this is the perihelion, the aphelion. I've drawn a line from the center of the sun to the starting position of the eclipse just here. We've got the orbital path, we've got the dummy object, and I've inserted the Earth just close by for now. So what this dummy object allows you to do is um, have an object moving in one direction, 
whilst independently rotating in another direction. That's the whole purpose of this dummy object. So first of all, I have to align the dummy object's orientation to match the Earth. So to do that, um, I'm going to pick the dummy, use the align tool, pick the target object, which is the Earth, and as you can see, we've got the orientation aligned in the X, the Y, and the Z, um, and we're just going to go OK on that. So you can see it's now orientated this sort of box, this dummy box, to the same orientation as the Earth. Now what I want to do is align the Earth to the dummy object. So it's in the opposite direction. So let's first of all pick the Earth and all of its constituent parts. Pick the align tool. I want to align it to the dummy object, but this time we want to not align the axis, although it probably will be the same, but we want to align the X, the Y and the Z position. There we go. So it's now placed the Earth um, sort of in that box. So what we have to do now is to make the Earth a child object to the dummy object. So I'll just drag and drop it onto it. And now it should move with the earth, which it does. So now we need to get it spinning. Let's get it back to position one. But before we do, let's just add the sun in, or a light source anyway. So let's zoom into here. And we're going to pick a light. We're going to pick an omnidirectional light. There's all different types of lights. You can, you know, spotlights and um, target direct lights. But I'm going to pick omni. Um, which puts in a light source that emits light in 360 degrees, sort of spherically, in 360 degrees, so in all directions. Um, and I'm going to place it just there. Now if we go back and look at the Earth, it should have put the terminator line in, in the correct location, which it has. Okay, let's get this Earth spinning. <clears throat> One of, good, one of the good things about this is along the way I can check various things to make sure we're on track and, I'm, and what I'm doing is accurate. Um, so that, that, was the, that was the reason for drawing in this line from the centre of the sun to the starting position. Um, because if you remember earlier we drew the, the zenith position here using the longitude and latitude. And I can see if it intersects at that point. So I've rotated the earth so that it closely, as close as I can inter, it intersects with this point here. And as you can see, it's not 100% perfect. It's not far off. It's as close as I can get it. Um, but again, I have used the numbers given. <clears throat> I've not changed any numbers. I've not manipulated anything. So I think for the purposes of this eclipse, it's close enough. And um, so how do, how, how do we get this spinning at the right rate? This website here, Cora.com, um, there's a question on here posed, how many degrees does the Earth rotate in one solar day, i.e. the typical 24 hours? And somebody's put the correct answer is 360.9856 degrees, which I can concur does seem to work. Um, and they put a little diagram down here, so let's say this is the st starting position, so the red line is facing the sun. Um, in three, when, once this is done 360 degrees, it will be here. But remember, the Earth has moved on its orbit to here, so it's no longer facing the Sun. So that's a sidereal day, and that's a 360 degree rotation, and that takes, according to this, 23 hours 56 minutes. For it to do that extra little bit, so that it is facing the Sun, um, it needs to go 360.9856 degrees per day. So. Um, that would be a solar day, and that is an exact. That is 24 hours, exactly 24 hours. So using that figure, I can calculate how many degrees the Earth rotates in one minute. It's a fairly simple calculation. I've done it already just there, but I'll go through it again. So we've got 360.9856. I'm going to divide that by the number of minutes in a day, which is 1440. 
So this figure here, 0.250, um, is the um, the angle that the Earth rotates every minute. So I'm going to sorry, I'm going to copy that. Copy. Um, now in 3D Studio Max, we can select the Earth, and we can open what's called the Curve Editor for the Earth. And this is how we can manipulate the Earth to move. So we can either move its position or we can move its rotation. So the rotation and the Z rotation is what we want. So if we zoom, you'll see that there is no, no rotation at the minute. It's just a straight line here. And that's at zero. So these along the bottom are frames, going up to 421 frames. <clears throat> and these up here are decimal degrees for rotation. So in order to get this spinning, what I'm going to do is add a keyframe. And I'm just going to randomly place it just here. It's put it at 13, but I want to put, I'm going to move that to 1. And if you watch down here, you'll see, see it moving to the 1 position. Uh, 1. There you go, it's moved to position 1. And that is correct. We don't want it to be rotated at all at position 1. So it's at 0. I can now add another keyframe. Just there. It's put it in at 14. I'm going to move it to number 2. And we're going to paste the value in here, which is the um, the rotation angle that we just found. So as there's all them recurring fours. It's 0.25068 recurring. I'm going to press enter. <coughs> it's rounded it up here, obviously. Um, and it's put position one and two in now. So if I zoom right in to this area here, you can see there's position one. There's position two, but it's put it in as this funny curved line, and I want it to be linear, so let's just change that quickly. I want it to be linear, not curve, linear. And position one, we want to be linear, and linear. So it's now a straight line. So position uh, keyframe one, keyframe two. So it's going to rotate from keyframe one. Um, 0.251, it has maintained the accuracy in there even though it's just rounded it um, and then obviously it will continue on along its path and carry on rotating. Let's just test that out. Let's take a top down view, zoom out a bit and we're going to move this along and if you see the red X and Y um, coordinates there, the red lines, watch them as they rotate and the Z remains in the same place, in the same orientation. Let's just play it. So as you can see it seems to be working okay and if I check the, the terminator line positions and what countries are in darkness and what are in light each position i.e. the end position and if I tie that up with timeanddate.com so UTC time um, 2200 hours I can check all these countries see what's in light see what's in darkness um, and it actually does match very very well so there we have it we have a spinning earth in the exact lo location it should be, rotating at the exact rate it should ro uh, rotate. <clears throat> now we've got to go and add the, the moon in. And you've seen the, the process that I use now to add things in and to get them moving. The moon is going to be very, very similar, so I'm not going to go into as much detail adding the moon, other than to tell you the, um, sort of the process of how I've done it, sort of summarise the process. So I've now imported the 3D Studio Max model into AutoCAD again and it's in the exact position, um, the starting position at 1500 hours. Um, it's obviously lost the, the, um, the pattern, the surface pattern, but it's actually a lot easier to draw the moon positions in than it was the Earth, simply because um, NASA published azimuths and elevations to the moon from a fixed reference point on the Earth, or you can get NASA's website to generate the information for you based on a fixed position on Earth. 
Um, so we don't have to go go about drawing circles and finding intersections. I can just draw lines at a certain length at a certain angle as given by NASA. Um, there is another little script language or programming language that AutoCAD will recognise and it's called Diesel and it's much easier than Lisp um, and that's why I'm able to do it. So I've done half of it already so if I zoom out all these lines coming out from Hopkinsville here are lines that extend to the position of the moon. So this is the path of the moon, all these endpoints, minute by minute. So I'm just going to do the second half of it. The, the diesel programming language is limited on characters. Um, so I had to do it in two halves. So I'll just click that button. And hopefully in a few seconds it should draw the rest of the, the positions of the moon. Okay, I think it's done. So if we zoom out a bit, it's drawn like this fan shape. But if I sort of scroll around it, you can see it's like in a, it's going on like a parabolic um, path. So this is the position of the moon in minute increments from Hopkinsville to Kentucky, um, starting at 1500 hours. UTC. So we can use AutoCAD's data extraction tool again and we can extract the XYZ coordinate of the endpoint of each of these lines which I have done and I've imported them into Excel. I've um, added all the syntax that MaxScript needs and I've um, imported it into 3D Studio Max. So it's drawn a line, it's taken all these points and it's drawn a line along the end of them all like this which is just here if I zoom right in and there is the arc that's been formed by the script so we have the earth in its starting position here we have the earth's path to here and of course this, um, the moon position, which I've drawn in here, this will, this will move along this, this line, um, but it's not actually moving along this line. It's sort of moving, well, let's just, let's just play it. You see the camera is on the moon at the minute. Zoom out a little bit. So I'm going to delete that line for now. That's confusing. Let's just. You can see what's happening. The moon. The moon is. It's it's taking this path, but it's it's not taking this path. It's moving the opposite way. If you see what I mean. Let's just. Let's turn the camera off and. I'll select the moon. So we can see it here. So you can see what it's doing. It's following that path. So at position one, it doesn't quite intersect with the sun. But at position, I believe it's 206 at maximum. If I was to draw a line from the Earth here now through the Moon, it would intersect with the Sun in the centre. So let's have a look at what it looks like during the eclipse. Okay, so we're starting at frame number one, and let's just play it, and we'll see if we can spot the anomalies. Okay, let's go back and look at the anomalies because there are quite a few. So position one, let's play it again. And the first thing you'll notice is the size of the shadow, which has been talked about verbatim. Um, 
I'd say this shadow based on these compass sizes that we drew at um, 2000 kilometer radius I'd say that this is probably a 3000 kilometer diameter this shadow as opposed to the 60 or 70 mile um, diameter shadow that is said gonna happen let's carry on playing it and you'll see that the path of the eclipse and the position of maximum eclipse does not match uh, what NASA are telling us so this, the center point of the eclipse is about here the Kentucky, uh, Hopkinsville Kentucky is here it's probably what 2,000 kilometers out so there's another anomaly um, the third one is the starting time and end time so let's get it so it disappears completely give it the benefit of the doubt so let's take that right down to 60 so 60 frames until let's give it a few more 340 so that will be 280 280 minutes so 280 minutes divided by 60 is 4.6 hours so that's about 4 hours and 40 minutes as opposed to um, starting at 1546 and ending at 2104 which is you know, that's about 5 hours and 20 minutes something like that so there's a 40 minute discrepancy on start and end time And remember, all I've done is copied and pasted NASA's data to create this, this model. That's all I've done. So the chances of me getting it to, getting the, the moon to come between the Earth um, and the sun to form the solar eclipse just by accident or to suggest that I've done something wrong in modeling it is pretty absurd because you know it, it wouldn't fall so perfectly like this at the time it's supposed to do if I'd done something wrong especially using copy and paste methods so I'm not saying it is absolutely 100% perfect I might, might very well have um, done something wrong so if anybody does spot anything I'd be happy to know um, there is the issue of the oblate sphericity of the earth which I haven't taken into account which can actually be taken into account um, but I don't think that that would make a difference personally um, it's supposed to be minor, very minor anyway um, so the fourth anomaly I want to look at is what it looks like when we're looking back at the sun from the earth um, so we'll do one at the center of the totality here and one maybe we'll, maybe we'll do one at Hopkinsville here as well um, just to see what it looks like from both positions as the um, moon comes in front of the sun right so I've put a camera at Hopkinsville here and I've put one at the bottom part of this compass as well just it was a convenient place to snap a camera to um, and it roughly falls in the center of the, um, the path of totality so here is the, the the views of what those cameras see so this is the totality one and this is the Hopkinsville one so let's just play it there we go so the the anomaly I found with this, other than the obvious, it doesn't work, um, is the actual sort of path that the moon takes and the trajectory it takes in front of the sun. So if we look at the top one, the cap, the totality one, it sort of approaches in from the right at a slight angle, crosses in front and then sort of carries on on that same sort of angle. And then the Hopkinsville one at the bottom there, 
it pretty much does a similar thing. I suppose it does come up. It's up. Yeah, I suppose it comes up a little bit and then starts to go down again. Like a parabolic motion. So there is a bit of a, a curve to where to what would be seen in Hopkinsville, whereas in the totality cam at the top it, it kind of comes more straight. So I just want to compare this to an animation on the timeanddate.com website. And this says, has it gone? This says that the, the animation shows what the eclipse approximately looks like near the maximum point. So this thing keeps just scrolling through. If we have a, if we have a look at it, and I'll try and match my model to what timeanddate.com animation shows on the left. So it's about to start again, and there it is. So it's the, the time and date model animation is coming in at a really, really steep 45 degree angle almost, then sort of leveling off until it hits totality. And then it sort of leaves and goes back up again which doesn't match any of the, um, the trajectories that I'm showing in my animation. So I would, I would question why it is that this, the moon actually comes in at such a sharp angle like that, almost 45 degrees, if we can go back again and look at that. This part, this part here is coming in at an almost 45 degree angle, then it's coming, eclipsing and then going back out at probably a I don't know, 15 degree angle. So that's quite a different, that's quite a change. If you compare that to what's going on in mine, it almost just crosses it in a straight line with a very, very slight curve. And the curve is actually in the opposite direction to what NASA is, at timeanddate.com are showing. So I know there's going to be a lot of people filming this. I'd be interested to see what actually does happen in real life. Whether it does come down at a steep angle like this, or whether it comes... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it will come like this, because this is what they're saying is going to happen. It just doesn't match um, what, what I've drawn here. And remember, if the only way to remedy this in my model... maximize this the only way to, that this could be remedied would be to move the moon up or to tilt the earth back into a different angle but if I move this up then it throws out all the angles that NASA are telling us that the moon is at and if I tilt the earth back that th throws out all the angles that NASA are telling us that the earth is at so there is really no remedy to this situation. So I would call anybody um, who's um, adept in AutoCAD and 3D Studio Max to model model it out themselves, get it to work. I mean, it should work. It has to work, right? It must work. If this is the model that they are pushing on us, then the geometry must work. And um, so. Feel free, somebody out there, prove me wrong, model it out yourself. Um, I'm going to have a break from this for a while now because, like I said, I've been doing it for eight months and it's taken up a lot of my time. Um, but when I return, I'm going to start looking at some other eclipse signatures like the ones you're looking at now because there's some right funny shapes. Um, so there's, a, there's another one by NASA here that's um, projected quite a long way into the future between 2051 and 2100. So this is in, oh sorry, this is on the 1st of May 2079. This weird looking one here. Not quite sure how that, how that can happen. But I'm definitely going to be modeling that one out. Um, I'll put, I'll do some lunar eclipses as well. And if anybody can think of a, an easier way for me to model this out, 
without drawing all the circles um, for the Earth position, I'd be um, happy to hear it. I um, even went on a maths forum, or a couple of different maths forums actually, um, to see if I could cut out AutoCAD altogether and just use Excel to use the, um, the values of an ellipse to calculate the positions. And although it is possible to do it mathematically, from what I've read, or from what I've been told, it um, involves an iterative method because you can't derive the formula or a, a formula directly. It, it involves an iterative method, which I don't really understand, um, let alone get an Excel to do it. So if anybody is able to do that, it involves three angles that you've got to find. Um, it's the eccentric anomaly, the uh, mean anomaly and the true anomaly you have to you have to determine three angles to be able to do it and um, so if anybody wants to look into that and see if they can work get Excel to calculate positions of the earth on the ellipse um, I'd be very grateful because then I could just enter the point coordinates directly without drawing out all the circles Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, the next videos I'm going to do won't have all this explanation in. I'll just refer back to this one. I won't go over everything. Um, so, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.